Hello and welcome to Frost Over the World. Later in the programme, artist Tracy Emin on her new exhibition and motoring journalist Jeremy Clarkson, motoring star Jeremy Clarkson, two of the greatest possible guests. We're delighted to have them both today and a look back on a TV interview which changed the history of Chile. But we begin with Afghanistan. ISAF, NATO's International Security Assistance Force, uh, now 11 years in, into Afghanistan, occupying Afghanistan as part of the global war on terror in 2001. There's been much debate in the last few years as to what the current purpose of the mission is. With the withdrawal of troops scheduled for 2014, many argue that Afghanistan will still be a failed state with the potential of increased chaos once the Afghan security forces are completely in charge themselves. Are the Taliban just as much of a threat as they were in 2001? Well, joining me now to discuss what is needed for continued stability in Afghanistan is the last UK ambassador to Kabul. In fact, he, he left there last month. He's here right now. Sir William Patey, welcome, William. Thank you for having me. Starting in the light of all that we, we just said there, um, what is the target of what we're doing now in Afghanistan? And how close to success or failure are we? Well, I think the target hasn't really changed. And then your introduction uh, very rightly takes people back to 2001 and the reason we're there, national security, getting rid of the, uh, the Taliban who were host to al-Qaeda. Uh, that, that is an, an important objective, but it also to leave Afghanistan in, in a position to make progress over the coming years. So there isn't a failed state that it doesn't resort to either ungoverned space or uh, to a regime that is uh, uh, sympathetic to domestic uh, international terrorism. Uh, and I think we have made huge progress. I don't accept that uh, when our uh, combat troops leave in 2014, uh, the Afghan forces will not be able to handle the residual security threat. And it's a but they, they would be unable to handle it if, they, if the rest of the world didn't come up with four billion. Absolutely, I, and we have to be clear about that. Uh, if we don't, uh, if we don't continue to provide uh, support for training and the funding of the Afghan security forces for a number of years beyond 2014, then we are asking for failure. Uh, I, I'm absolutely clear about that. If we, uh, I, but I, I'm confident we will raise the four billion. Uh, Britain has already announced a contribution of over 100 million dollars. There's a NATO conference in Chicago. Chicago coming up later this month, which will which will hopefully uh, lay the foundations for gathering the four billion that would be necessary. Yeah. But the situation doesn't really look as as good as it sounds when you you talk it. I mean. You see, I, I've just come, I've spent two years in yeah, Afghanistan yeah. and I've seen the areas where we are winning in terms of uh, building institutions. Uh, the Taliban used to gain support in places like Helmand and Kandahar because there was no government to speak of. There was, no, there was nothing for the people to turn to. The Taliban were the only alternative if they wanted justice. Well, over the last 10 years, that has changed, particularly over the last three years. We see provincial governance in places like Helmand. Every district has a district governor. There is a prosecutor there. Schools are opening clinics are opening. So the Afghan people now have a stake in, uh, they can see what their government has provided. And provided that government continues to use the assistance that they're getting from the international community to deliver the basic services to their people, the offer from the Taliban will appear very unattractive. At the same time, how, how great is ta Taliban support, let's say, at the moment in Afghanistan compared to 2001? Um, it depends. I, I think it's much less than 2001, uh, and, and, and obviously it depends on which part of the country you're in. I mean, in the north, uh, support is minimal. Uh, Taliban are finding it very difficult to uh, uh, to operate in, in parts of Afghanistan now. They don't have the safe havens they used to have. They've just announced a new spring offensive. Uh, well, this follows on from their, their, their last summer offensive, which was a failure. Uh, the Taliban are unable to take and hold ground. Now, the question is, when the international troops uh, come out, will they be able to overcome the Afghan National Security Forces? Uh, I think they'll find it, they're delusional if they think they can wait us out and then overthrow the Afghan army. The Afghan state that they will face in 2015 is a very different one that they faced in 1996-97 when they, when they took power. Uh, the institutions are stronger, the army is stronger, it's better trained, it has international support and provided we fund it, um, uh, the, uh, they will confront a very different situation. But what about, what about the future? Um, 
you really the thing we started with was really that if the people do not, if the countries do not come up, and ISAF countries and so on, come up with the money, everything, everything you positively said, falls by the wayside. I think so. I think uh, uh, Afghanistan is in balance. It's a, it's a very poor country. It's had 30 years of uh, conflict. Uh, it had high levels of Ill illiteracy. All these things can't be reversed in one generation. It hasn't yet developed its mineral resources. So it won't be able to afford the infrastructure of a state that has been established over the last 10 years without outside help. Um, so uh, even then it will be difficult. Even with outside help, it's not a given. Uh, but I, I would certainly predict that if the international community does not uh, continue to, to fund at a much lesser scale. I mean, let's remember the sorts of money that's been poured into Afghanistan now is 10, 20 times what we're asking for in 2015. So for a 20th of the cost of what we're spending now, we can finish the job. Uh, if we don't do that, then I, I would predict uh, a, a, a slide into, into failure. That's right, yes. Was, and the thought of wives sometimes uh, are quoted as saying, you know, it is maybe expensive. Uh, this coat may be expensive, you know. But uh, you know, look at how expensive the other one was. So this is cheap. <laughs> it's not quite like that. But, you know, it's, uh, I think that the panel, we the wife might say, um, uh, this coat was expensive. But do you want me to run around the streets naked? Yes. Uh, so it's not it's not comparison with another coat. Yes. It's 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 comparison. This coat is needed to keep me warm. If I didn't have this coat, I would perish in the cold. That's what we're talking about in Afghanistan. Right. Right. Well, we'll see how this follows up and so on. And the, uh, and the situation you're talking there about not taking our eye off the ball, uh, I hope also that this weekend, Queen's Park Rangers, your team, does not take their eye off the ball because well, that would be very we're serious. All, we're all hoping and praying for Queen's Park Rangers and my other team, Hibs, in the cup final. So uh, it could be a terrible weekend or a good weekend. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, William, for being with us. My Thank pleasure. You. Thank you. If the Eurozone was a roller coaster, you'd want to get off. No sooner have Europe's changing cast of political leaders caught their breath than they are propelled into the next set of disasters. Spain on the brink of economic meltdown and Greece desperately seeking a stable government. But now there's a different crisis. Israel. Formerly insulated from the worst of the European financial crisis, Israel is now facing its own economic judgment day. Moody's has lowered its projection for the credit rating of the Israeli banking system from stable to negative, while Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu surprised everyone by forming a new coalition government with Kadima, the centrist opposition party. The governor of the Bank of Israel, Professor Stanley Fisher, joins me now from Jerusalem. Stanley, I, I think it came as quite a surprise to some people th this week that uh, yesterday, in fact, that Moody's had lowered its projection for the credit rating of the Israeli banking system from stable to negative. Because you've had quite a few bouquets about how good the system is. Was this a surprise? Uh, it was a surprise. The uh some of the things they say we are, of course, fully aware of, our geopolitical situation, the fact that the economy is growing a bit more slowly than we would have liked, about 3%. Uh, but on the whole, uh, we think the banks are in a pretty strong position. And so uh, we, were, we were surprised uh, about it. And uh, we'll, of course, uh, have to check everything they said and uh, react where appropriate. Yes, apparently they, they talked about the security and economic challenges that Israel faces. I suppose uh, security is a factor in terms of assessing future finances. Yes, I mean, we're, we're talking about big things now. Obviously, the uh, uncertainty about the Iranian situation is of a much different order of magnitude yeah. than the sort of security problems that Israel is now quite used to uh, dealing with. And that, that's the unusual factor in this whole equation. Right. And talking, therefore, of, of Iran, the other news uh, this week about uh, Mr. Benjamin Netanyahu forming a coalition which will involve Kadima, the, mo the moderate opposition, in the same... Will that affect the policy towards Iran, do you think? 
Well, that, that's not really uh, my area. And, no. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure either way. I could make an argument either way, which probably means that it'll be more or less neutral, but uh, that's not a good basis for making arguments. Uh, I, economically speaking, uh, part of the uh, agreement of the coalition is to deal with uh, the budgetary issue, and that's, very, uh, that's a very promising aspect of this, uh, of this agreement. And what effect on you economically do the headlines that we see all week, or the actual events behind the headlines, of what, what's happening now, shockingly really, in Spain, it's a surprise to many people, and Greece, do those two situations have a direct effect on Israel's finances, your finances? Uh, well, as far as trade goes, uh, we don't trade very much with either of those countries. But if, uh, as a result of developments in either, there were to be a serious problem in the euro area, possibly changes, possibly a country might leave or something, uh, which would lead to a much worse financial situation in Europe, that would absolutely certainly have an effect on us. In fact, has the whole situation in Europe had a negative effect over the past, well, 18 months on Israel, or have you... Would you say you've come through it all so far swimmingly? Uh, we're, we're swimming, but not swimmingly. Uh, our growth is slower. We had grown close to 5% in 2010 and 2011. We're probably growing about 3%, a little bit more possibly now. Uh, and some of that is undoubtedly due to a decline in exports to uh, some European countries. So it has had an effect on us. Uh, the general financial situation, decline in interest in foreign countries and so forth, is having a, an effect on us. As of now, it's, it's uh, a noticeable but not a deep effect. And we hope it, uh, it stops uh, right where it is, but that remains to be seen. So it remains to be seen, therefore, whether the current rate of growth can can rise again in Israel, and uh, could, other, could other countries in the Eurozone and so on take lessons from the, the ways in which the Israeli economy has, has fared quite well? Well, I, I think part of the secret to uh, our success, relative success, uh, is that we had a severe crisis in 2001-2003 after which the government really got its finances in order and uh, within a few years had worked a very large budget deficit of 6% down to zero by 2007. So we've been in a reasonably good budgetary situation since uh, the mid-2000s. And uh, it's not as good as we would like it to be, but it's nowhere near as bad as others. And, uh, you know, on many things, the answer to how you deal with a crisis is it depends on what you did beforehand and whether you were in good shape before it started rather than how you respond to it. I think the uh, second aspect of what we did was we do have, despite uh, the uh, Moody's negative watch, uh, we do have a, uh, a very strong banking system that has been critical in maintaining the financing of companies. So we haven't had financial problems in the sense of inability to get credit uh, during this crisis, during the crisis of 2008-9, or during the current crisis. And those two factors are really central. And uh, unfortunately, those, things that you, those are things you have to do beforehand uh, and that are much harder to do once you get into difficulties. Right. So at the moment, as you gaze ahead, um, does that bring you a sense of optimism about the way the finances of Israel and, and indeed the Eurozone where it affects Israel? Do you, do you feel optimistic about the future, sh the short and medium term future financially of Israel and Europe? Well, <laughs> those, are, uh, those are two separate questions. Yes. I think we'll, man we'll manage pretty well. Uh, I would say we're cautiously optimistic, and the caution is we're going to have to uh, 
maintain our supervision standards very well. Our government's going to have to strengthen the budget situation, which this coalition agreement may make possible. With regard to Europe, uh, you're dealing with a much more complicated problem because it's a problem of 17 countries, not one. Uh, it's a problem of a currency area, and uh, it's a problem of countries which are already in deep uh, difficulty. So I, I would say that for the long term, I'm confident about the continuation of the euro area. Uh, I'm confident that the difficult processes that many countries are going through now will pay off eventually, but I can't say that I know what's going to happen in the next two or three years, and that's the source of our uncertainty. So, in fact, you can view ten years hence with more clarity and more optimism than you can view three years hence. I think that's frequently the case, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> And furthermore, when the time comes, nobody will remember whether I was optimistic or not. So that's also an advantage. Yes, very much indeed. And that's a very, very good protection mechanism and so on. Well, we, we do thank you very much indeed for joining us, Stanley. And uh, we look forward to talking again in less than three years. And uh, perhaps when you're, when you're next in London. Thank you very much indeed well, for being with us today. Thank you very much, Sir David. A pleasure to talk to you. And now a short footnote to history on television. In 1988, one man raised his finger on live television, denounced a dictator, and went on to change the political history of Chile. That man is Ricardo Lagos, who later became president. On the evening of the 25th of April, 1988, in the first television program to feature opposition candidates during Augusto Pinochet's brutal regime, Ricardo Lagos did something extraordinary and became the nemesis of a dictator. Muy brevemente, creo que la noche del no es el inicio del triunfo del no, es el inicio del fin de la dictadura. Y más importante, creo indispensable que en ese momento el país tenga claro que habremos impedido que el general Pinochet esté 25 años en el poder. El general Pinochet no ha sido claro con el país. Primero dijo, primero dijo usted, general Pinochet, que había acá metas y no plazos. Después, general Pinochet, Tuvo plazos y planteó su constitución del 80. Le voy a recordar, general Pinochet, que usted el día del plebiscito de 1980 dijo presidente Pinochet no sería candidato en 1989. La Cámara está enfocando, espero. Y ahora le promete al país otros ocho años con tortura, con asesinatos, con violación de derechos humanos. Me parece inadmisible que un chileno tenga tanta ambición de poder de pretender estar 25 años en el poder. Ricardo, si bien, algunos nunca ha estado así. Ricardo, aquí los que están va a que responder, son ustedes. Y usted va a tener que responder entre el sí o el no. Ricardo, lo y que yo el país quiere saber... yo lo a que hiciera... Raquel, usted me va a excusar. No, es que, es que Hablo por 15 años de silencio. And he's with us now. Um the man himself, Ricardo Lagos, joins me now from Santiago. And when we cut to what you were saying at that particular point, that was not in fact you at the end of that clip, of course. That was someone else, an interpreter and so on. What was it that made you speak out in the way you did that day, President? Well, what happened, you know, that day is that uh, for me it was so important because it was the first time in 15 years that the opposition was able to talk straight to the camera, on TV, on live TV, and I knew that uh, Pinochet was uh, looking at what we are going to do. And therefore, it was so important for us to be able to, at that moment, to speak very clearly to the Chilean people, not to be afraid of a dictator. And did you think it would have a dramatic impact? 
as in fact it did? Well, what happened, you know, was that in order to be a, a legal, quote unquote, political party, we have to have we have to ask about 35,000 signatures of Chileans backing that party in order to become legal. And that means that you have to defeat fear. It was not easy for any Chilean to sign in favor of a party that is going to oppose the dictator. And therefore, this was uh, essential from our point of view. And I told the people, look, if you sign, we are legal. And if we are legal, we are going to be on TV. And once that we are on TV, we are going to be able to speak straight to the Chilean people. So we have a responsibility in a sense that now we are on TV and those people that signed for us, we are looking if it is, was true what we are going to do. In other words, I feel obliged to those people that they are also to, to, to challenge Pinochet back in our party. But I discovered that was extremely uh, electrifying for the people when you address a straight, uh, a straight to the dictator. So I had done that before. What I didn't measure was the impact to do that on TV, the impact to talk with so many hundreds or probably millions of Chileans looking on that night on TV. When you challenged uh, General Pinochet in that way, and he was a brutal dictator, and everybody knew he was a brutal dictator, and that we knew that was a brave action, but did you expect, as you delivered that speech sort of direct to him, not in the studio, but at, at home watching, um, when you delivered that, did you have fear were you afraid that the dictator's machine might sweep you up and uh, execute you or torture you? Well, w what happened? I had been in prison uh, three, three years before that for a short period of time, right after the attempt against Pinochet's life in September 86. And they put me to prison, assuming they knew, they, they knew that I had nothing to do with that. But the, the question was that in Pinochet once, addressed straight to me saying, there is somebody called Lagos, and watch out. We are observing what he's doing. Thank you for being with us and to say we look forward to having you with us again in the future, and particularly, yes. please let us know if you're going to be in London. OK, thank you, sir. Bye-bye. In a moment, uh, controversial artist Tracy Emman and controversial journalist Jeremy Clarkson. There's lots more to them than that, but you'll find out after this short break.